Mervyn McCord fighting with the Royal Ulster Rifles finally got his first taste of combat. I can still remember one's reaction when one saw one or two people and uh, you knew if it wasn't them, it was you. And uh, I can to this day still remember the first one, the startled look on his face as he... But uh, you soon get over that. You killed him? Yeah, quite a lot of them. I mean, it was either they killed us or we killed them. And I mean, there were lots and lots and lots of them. For bravery during this winter fighting, Mervyn McCord was awarded the Military Cross. The new offensive by the Chinese created panic amongst desperate Korean civilians. Seeing how this war could shatter the lives of the innocent was a profound shock to Chaplain Sam Davies. A lot of people left North Korea to flee south while they had the opportunity. So one saw these wretched people, women and children, uh, walking with their bundles on their backs. The sight of refugees is always pitiful, always. And we saw that, and that impressed me very much. You just hoped and prayed that they would, they would come through safely. Many refugees did not survive. A witness to this was 21-year-old Captain Guy Temple of the Gloucesters. A number of babies were frozen to death, and I saw those being thrown into the river. One then realized about war and its awfulness. As winter turned to spring, the 29th Brigade resumed their march north towards the Imjin River. During this advance, Sam Davies had his first experience of combat. I remember going up in company with the doctor and the medical team, behind the troops going up, and we knew in the valley below there were centurion tanks who were also shelling above us. One was always hoping and praying that they wouldn't fall short and, uh, and fall on us. One shocking thing I always remember is seeing a Chinese soldier leaning forward over his bunker, uh, dead of course, but it's as though his skull had been scooped out from behind. It was like an empty eggshell in a way. I suppose blown out by the force of uh, artillery. Here, Derek Hurst learned how to deal with the brigades dead and dying. There was one casualty brought into us and it was very badly wounded and uh, it was fairly obvious I got the ammo to have a look at him and uh, without him seeing like, you know, he just said, no. And uh, he says, shall I be all right, Loft, to me? And I says, oh, I think so, yeah. I said, I'll give you some morphine. I said, and you wake up in Japan and there'll be a little Japanese girl there looking after you. And a few minutes later, he was dead. I won't describe his injuries because his mother might be watching. But it was pretty horrific. By April 1950, the now battle-hardened 29th Brigade was on the 38th parallel, taking up defensive positions overlooking the Imjin River. The Imjin and its surrounding hills had always been the historic invasion route from the north. A breakthrough here would guarantee a rapid advance to the capital, Seoul. The UN expected the weight of China's spring offensive to be concentrated at this vital point. British patrols were sent north across the river to seek them out, but they found nothing of any danger. On the other side of the river, veteran Chinese commander Peng De Huai was playing a waiting game. He was holding his divisions back, out of sight. 
Marshal Peng knew his men could march rapidly, at least 20 miles, straight into battle. By Sunday the 22nd of April, small numbers of Chinese scouts had been seen. But it was considered safe enough for Sam Davies to give communion to the men. I had no feeling in my mind at the time that these young people I was giving communion to would, uh, some of them would be killed within a few hours. Um, it was just um, a very plain, simple service, holy communion. That evening, Peng finally ordered his men to advance towards the Imjin. At the same time, the commander of the Gloucesters, Colonel Khan, sent a battle patrol back down to the river. It was led by Guy Temple, who had an order to retreat if his men encountered a force of more than 30 Chinese. I took 16 men, three Bren guns, and a two-inch mortar, and a lot of ammunition. I asked Lance Corporal Patrick to put a two-inch mortar illuminating flare up, which he did. And then we saw the Chinese in the water. Well, it was a hundred, and then at the end, well, I would have thought it had to be something like uh, three battalions. They were thick in the water. So it means about three battalions, probably 700 men in a battalion, you know, somewhere around about 2,000 men in the water. It was an astonishing target. That's how we saw it. And we did use all our ammunition. Throughout this first moonlit night, more Chinese continued to pour across the river. Every forward position of the brigade opened fire. The Battle of the Imjin River had begun. Very loud bugle was blowing, uh, the Chinese screaming their heads off, uh, fireworks going off, rockets going off, and uh, very light pistols going off, and flares and everything. It's a pandemonium, really. Marshal Peng committed 40,000 troops alone against the brigade. Elsewhere, along the 170-mile front line, American and other UN troops were facing similar human wave attacks. For Peng, it was make or break. He needed to smash the UN quickly to succeed. On the Imjin, the first of many acts of valor would soon take place. During this first night of the battle, A Company of the Gloucesters had been under constant attack. One of their officers was a young lieutenant called Philip Curtis. Curtis had gone to Korea just after the death of his wife from TB. Fellow officer Jeff Costello remembers his grief. He didn't care whether he lived or died, and he didn't really, um, really care if he had any more life. I think that was his... Um, if you got deep down with Phil, that's really what applied. <laughs> 